and you were first hired at AU after July 1st, 2013, which is going to apply to all of you, I'm sure, uh, then you have to do one of three things. You can join the union and pay dues. You can decide not to join, but you will still have to pay the union what's called an agency fee to compensate the union for representing you, even though you're not a member. Because if you're in the bargaining unit, that is to say that definition of a set of positions that are covered, then they have to represent you even if you decide not to join. And the third option is you can inform the union that you uh, are exempt from paying any dues or fees because the nature of other employment that you may have would create a conflict of interest. And there's a list of exempt occupations in Article 9 of the bargaining agreement, and it includes things like government employees, employees of international organizations, and about half a dozen or so other specific occupations. So if you have any doubt, take a look at that. Um, but you can't just decide on your own that you're exempt. You still have to uh, go to the union website, which we'll show you here in just a second, uh, and the screen share. Uh, and fill out a, a, a form that's on the union website uh, in order to explain which of the three options you want to choose. Uh, you have to choose one of them. And I would encourage you to do that sooner rather than later in order to get it out of the way. Are we having trouble getting to the SEIU website? So I, I'm on it. I. I thought it was sharing it says it's sharing right now no we're still it. share i think we're still sharing oh no that's right you're you, i'm yeah. sorry my mistake no. i misread it you are in the right place um and yes and so you know you you start out on the uh on the landing page and of the union you go to the top where it says my workplace click on american university adjuncts and it takes you to this page and there you can see it says select your yeah there we go so there's the home page and they select your union status. Um, so as I say, one of three things, join the union and pay dues, decide not to join, pay the agency fee, or um, tell the union that you believe that you're exempt. Uh, the union, you do have to inform them and they ultimately have the right to decide whether or not they think you really are exempt. If you have a disagreement with the union about that, uh, then you should be in touch with us here at the university and we'll help you uh, help you work through that. So far, we haven't really had any problems like that. Um, I do, I wanna underscore the importance of doing this because if you don't uh, choose one of these three statuses, then under the terms of the collective bargaining agreement, we will not be able to have you back to teach for us in the future. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So please don't delay in going to that website and declaring your union staff. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to answer any questions that you uh, might have about any. Thanks, Phil. Okay, very good. Um, there was a question uh, there, that popped up in the chat. Yeah, questions, yeah. Just, uh, questions just popped up in the chat here. But not related to adjunct. Um, oh, okay, uh, fire away. Apologies for any noise in the background. Um, this is just a, a slightly different question, but I'm only asking because you're here from the provost's office. Sure. I'm setting up my course syllabus right now, and I was looking at the rules and regulations for this that apply to the students. And I noticed there's one for graduate students and one for undergrad students. I noticed in the undergrad students, there's a section that talks about things like excused absences and whatnot, but that seems to be missing in the graduate. Are they supposed to be mirror copies of each other with that, with that sort of content? Or where do I go to find the, grad, the, the larger graduate student rules and regulations? So there, there is a section of academic regulations for graduate students. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't, I don't have the URL of that. <laughs> that I, I, I've got it. Yeah. Top of my head. Uh, but, uh, there, but there is academic regulations. Specific. 
Yeah, I've got the, uh, I've actually got them up on screen here. Okay, and it, but, does, it doesn't answer your question? No, because there was a pretty clear section. And this is something we could talk about offline later and whatnot. I just thought since you were here, you might happen to know. Sure, now um, off the top of my head, I do not. Okay. But, but let's let's follow up and we'll we'll sort it out. Brilliant, thanks. Thanks, Phil. And Thank my you. name, yeah, my name is uh, Marilyn McClure, and I am the director of HR faculty administration. And so, um, myself and my team, the faculty team in HR, we would be your first points of contact for any questions that you may have um, about uh, pre-boarding. So, those of you that uh, pre-boarded with us, including the background check, and then the onboarding with Equifax Online that included your I-9 document, your taxes, we would be your point of contact to assist you with any of that. And then once you are onboarded, um, we, you know, you you can definitely reach out to us at any time with questions about payment and um, stipends and anything that comes to your employment. We maintain your personnel files as well. Um, just a couple things to point out. Um, if you have not received the emails from Equifax, they come from an email, AU Human Resources, um, please alert me right away. That should take you, take you to a, a different login page. It's, a, it's powered by Equifax, and it's a login that's not associated with your AU portal, and that is where you fill out all the new hire documents. And so if that is missing, please let me know right away so we can find out where that is and get that to you as soon as possible. Once that's complete, the next step would be the I-9 verification. So for that, that is an in-person verification if you are local to DC, Maryland, or Virginia, and you do have to visit the Human Resources Office. We're open Monday through Friday, nine to five, and um, you need to bring your original documents, whatever you select from the I-9 field uh, to come in to verify in person. And uh, so that does need to be done right away. It's usually three days. Uh, no later than three days after the start of your class. So that does have to be done as soon as possible. Um, any questions about Equifax? I think I saw something pop up in the chat. Let's see. Okay, no. So Melissa asked, if you've already done Equifax and I-9 last year, you don't have to do that. So that's just when you first are hired. There would be another instance where you would have to do it. And that's if you uh, did leave American University and there was a gap of employment of uh, greater than 12 months. Um, but that is a full stop of your employment for a full 12 months. And so if you just did it last year, then you, you should be okay. Um, but I'll take your name down regardless, Melissa, just so I can double check. I'll just go into the file. And if I do see that there's something missing, um, I will send you an email. If you don't hear from me, that means that you're, you're good to go. Yeah, because Marilyn, I know last year we had where it was marking my like tax set status as single originally instead of married. I don't know if that rings a bell to you, but yes. um, I think we should probably offline that in general just to be 100% sure. Right. Absolutely. I can double check that. And a couple of things, you know, that that's a, a great thing to to mention about how to look at your federal and your withholdings and anything that's coming out of your paycheck. We have what is called earning statements, and you can find those in AU portal um, under work at AU. And I will note that we have two menus in the main dashboard, work at AU. The one on the left-hand side, that's where you'll find that. So work at AU, it expands, and you'll see one that says earning statements. Their paycheck subs, all your paycheck subs are there. So I encourage all of you to look through them after every paycheck, make sure that they're okay. Any questions, uh, you would reach out to me and my team and we can definitely help you out. But you'll see the, the taxes there, um, any other deductions um, in these earning statements as we call them. Um, okay, and I see, I see another one, someone that hasn't received it. Um, so um, Ruki, I will reach, I will investigate and reach out to you. And then one other question. Um, okay, uh, so Jasmine, if you had a different position before you became an adjunct, there's a 99% chance that you will not have to do the Equifax packet. Um, usually once you're hired and if you've been paid by AU payroll, that means you don't have to do that. Um, but like the same with Melissa, I will still go in and double check your status. And um, if there's an issue, I will write you. If you don't hear from me, that means you're all set. 
Um, another place that's useful to know in the AU portal is direct deposit. So if that's not something that you've set up, that's where you would go to set that up. And again, in the same place, AU portal, work at AU, again, on the left-hand side menu, and it's um, uh, Eagle Service Banking Information. I encourage everyone to take a look at that. If you are choosing paper check, that will be mailed to you. So please be sure that you have the most updated, correct mailing address on file with us. And again, you will find that in the earnings statement. The paycheck step does show the address that we have on file for you. Um, okay, and then another question about status. Carl, let me take a look. and. Um, and are, are you are you wondering if you are adjunct status, part time status? Can you tell me a little bit more about your question, Carl? OK, so adjunct status. OK, you know what? Let me just take a look. Let, uh, I'll go into your file. I'll take a look and then I can write you um, everything that I find. And if there's something that may be missing, we, we can work through it together. Okay, fantastic. And then another thing that I wanted to point out is on that adjunct faculty website that um, Bill pointed out uh, on the bottom or right hand side, you have some quick links. And one of them, I believe it's the top one talks about retirement benefits as a part time employee and adjunct, you are eligible for retirement benefits. So I encourage everyone to visit that site. And um, if it's something that interests you to enroll, um, but that is a benefit um, for our part-time employees, adjunct employees as well. Um, and then any technical issues that you may have. So if you have any issues uh, logging into the EU portal, accessing your email, Canvas account, anything like that, um, OIT. So easiest is to email helpdesk at american.edu. Um, I like calling. <laughs> so if any of you are callers, um, it's 202 885 2550. Um, so that is a direct line to um, great people. They're very helpful. They can sort out any technical or access issue that they have. And if it isn't access issue because of your status, um, they're very good about reaching out to directly to me and I can verify that for, for them to get you on your way. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is parking. As an adjunct faculty member, as long as you're not a full-time student or um, a staff member, if you're an adjunct part-time employee, you are eligible for free parking during the day. And for that, you would need to go to parking and traffic services to set up your parking pass for the day. And again, that's just um, a benefit for adjunct faculty who do not have uh, full-time status as a student or staff. Any other questions about new hire documents, benefits, Um, Donnie? Yes. Yes. So my class will be in the evening. Do I still need a parking pass? It starts at six. I think it's from you, six to nine fifty. You won't. No, after five p.m. No, is it five or five thirty? Um, it's um, I think it's after five o'clock. You do not need a parking pass after five. Thank you, Shen. But it is there. So if you want to enroll, just in case you ever come to a daytime event, that way you don't have to worry about it, um, you would have it ready. But yes, thank you for clarifying. That's right. So it won't let you pay. So the it's a it's an app that won't allow you to pay after five. So you're you'd be good to go. So do I need to download the app if, if I you, want to come to a daytime event or no? Yes, that way you can get the the pass for that. And to be honest with you, I would reach out to parking and transportations because there, there is something particular about adjunct parking passes. So for example, for me that I have to pay for parking, I do have that app. So if I come during the daytime, that's how that's what I used to pay. Okay, thank you. And another question popped up, do you have these to-do requirements listed somewhere? So Sean, um, you should have received an email from me actually right after um, you were, uh, once you received the appointment offer letter with these items listed, but I can definitely look for it and re-forward it to you um, because depending on when you were appointed, it might've been a while ago. So, um, you know, when you first get started, sometimes it's just another email, you get like three or four emails <laughs> in a row. So let me look for it and I will send it to you. Now, um, and I just a quick question before I'm done. I promise I'm almost done. Are there any out of area um, adjunct faculty members with us today uh, with Nexors? Everyone's local here. 
Okay, so then I won't go into the uh, the next source adjunct portion of it. Thank you, you all. <laughs> you mean local as in like the DMV area, correct? Correct. Actually, uh, Maryland, Virginia, and DC. So not just DMV, it's the uh, Commonwealth, the state, and so on. So you, you, um, if I'm, um, oh, okay. And Sophia, are you coming in to teach? No, I'm, I'm going to be a visiting scholar. So I'm going to do research. Um, oh, okay. So I'm going to be here in Colombia most of the time. Okay. Um, I think you, you're okay. So it's not, you're not part of Dexor. So you don't have to worry about that. So I think you're, you're, you're fine. And then we have Kenya Rukia also, is this AU abroad? Yes, it is. S -S. Oh, yes. Okay. So it's also not next door. So you're okay right. with that. Right. And you. Tyrone is saying, um, so Tyrone, so if you were just appointed beginning in the fall, you will receive the Equifax emails 30 days before the start of your course. Um, so if your course is starting, you know, August 15th, you should expect it mid-July. And Vera, yes, yes, and I and I do recognize your name. So you're you'll you'll be fine, um, uh, Dr. Felicetti. You will as soon as you arrive. Um, nothing with next doors that you'll have to worry about that. Thank you, everybody. Please reach out to me. I'm going to type in my email address on the chat before I go. But any questions, not just through the onboarding and new hire process, but as payments come in, um, please be sure to reach out to me. Um, we do have a website on um, through the AU portal, the payroll schedule. So that one is good because it does have it broken down by biweekly and the adjunct payroll. So that should tell you how when to expect your paychecks. But if anything else comes up, I'm happy to walk through um, anything with you. Good luck and, and welcome to American. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Kyo. Yeah, thank you so much, Marilyn. And also, thank you. Thank you, Bill, too. I think Bill left us already, but thank you for um, coming to welcome our new adjunct. So my name is Anna Olson. I am the Associate Director of Programs and Events at CTRL. And uh, first of all, I also want to welcome you to American University. I um, myself have been here since 2004, and it uh, seems to be a place that is hard to leave. I teach as an adjunct as well, so I'm, I'm uh, going through many of the same uh, processes uh, that you are going through. Um, so as we move through today's program, I just wanted to mention, too, uh, that we would love for you to keep your video on if you would like to, so we can see each other. It, it's I always find that a helpful way to... Uh, to feel the community, uh, um, but um, it's not mandatory, obviously, but if you would like to go on camera, we would welcome that. Hi, Deika. Um, and, and then also feel free to post any questions as we go through the next segment in the chat at any time. We'll have a designated time for Q&A at the end of the session as well. Um, so I'm just going to quickly reshare my screen. Um, so I am going to take about 10 to 15 minutes now to, um, to talk about the resources provided to you by CTRL. Um, and so CTRL, when we are on campus, uh, we are located in Hearst Hall, which is uh, the building you should be seeing behind me right now. It's, of course, not there. It's, it's just a photograph, but that is Hearst Hall. Um, and um, so CTRL's mission um, is to promote excellence in teaching and scholarship at American University. And, and this directly translates mainly to supporting you as our faculty in these endeavors. Uh, and of course, this is a very broad mandate. So um, with the little time I have, I wanna spend most of my time talking about how CTRL carries out this mission in the realm of teaching support with a particular focus on what we do and want to do to support adjunct faculty. Uh, first, also, I want to just briefly introduce my colleagues, uh, some of whom you've met already and some of whom you will meet shortly for the next segment. Um, here they are. Um, and um, we also have 14 faculty fellows, which you can see on this page here. Uh, our faculty fellows support our mission by holding and organizing workshops, uh, by advising faculty on topics on diversity, equity and inclusion, and also working on research projects related to teaching and learning, uh, plus a variety of other things. So you will often see them at many of our events. Um, CTRL's teaching support mainly falls into three categories. 
Um, although it's also something that constantly changes uh, based on the need of uh, needs of our faculty. So uh, first we have three big teaching conferences every year. Uh, and especially if you're staying on into the fall and possibly the, the spring semester ne next year, you, you'll find several of these of interest. Uh, so first, the August faculty workshops, uh, this is a three day professional development conference for faculty that is designed to prepare them for the fall semester. Uh, usually it's held about two weeks, the last two weeks before the fall semester begins. And then we have the Anne Farron conference, which we just held for the 34th year this January. Uh, none of us have been uh, with the conference for so long, but um, it, it's a very long tradition at AU, and, and it's the largest faculty event actually at AU with uh, between 400 and 500 participants who gather for a two-day uh, full of workshops on the Thursday and Friday before spring courses start to, to learn from each other, to make new connections, and so forth. And then we also have the May faculty workshops, uh, which is a series of workshops and institutes for faculty that are designed to enable more in-depth learning and, and some preparation for summer teaching and research projects and the like. Uh, and as you may know, we held a majority of, of this year's workshops this past week. Uh, I think I recognize some of your names. I think some of you have been to them and, and I hope you had a chance to attend some of them. There's one more coming up this Tuesday on community-based learning. If you're interested, you can still register for that. All right, so then we also have a number of other types of workshops and events throughout the year. Um, uh, primarily our teaching and learning workshops, um, which are hands-on workshops on topics related to pedagogy and teaching strategies. And they are uh, held up to nine times or so each semester. So throughout the semester, typically hosted by our team of teaching and learning specialists. So you will also meet in a little bit. Um, we also have a series called the uh, Critical Perspectives on Teaching and Learning. And uh, this is uh, a series of events that um, focuses entirely on inclusive pedagogy. Uh, and then in case you are actively conducting research, we have uh, research methods talks, which are hands-on workshops on research methodology tools. Uh, it could also be a place where faculty share and discuss methodological or other aspects of their research. And then finally, we have some ad hoc or special events. Uh, often they're co-sponsored with other offices bringing guest speakers to campus or to provide uh, a space for faculty to discuss topics that come up through current events. So all of these events are advertised on our website, which we encourage you to explore, uh, as well as via social media. We also send invitation emails to all of our faculty um, for all of our events. So keep an eye on your inbox for emails from ctrl at american.edu. Um, and also to be mindful of the schedules of many of our adjunct faculty who work full-time jobs during the day, we hold several workshops also during evening hours or like today on a weekend. Uh, and we will also typically make all of our workshops available via live stream, even if they're partially held in person. Uh, so if you are on social media, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram uh, using the handle at CTRL underscore AU, uh, if that's how you prefer to find out about our activities. Then just finally, although we typically don't hold as many workshops and events during the summer, uh, with the exception, of course, of the late August faculty workshops, uh, we sometimes do events in June and July. So keep an eye on your inbox as you might see invitations during that time as well. And then finally, the third category of teaching support is our one on one teaching consultations. Uh, so we have three great soon four teaching and learning specialists on our staff, Hannah Jardine, Matt, uh, Matt Kreit and Shad Silliman, who you will meet in a little while. And uh, any faculty member can request a one-on-one -on -one consultation with any of them to talk about any aspect of your teaching. Um, and I think I, they might talk about this a little bit later as well, but if uh, Hannah, Shad or Mac, if you could put the link to signing up for consultations in the chat, uh, we can also include that later on uh, in the follow-up email as well. And then finally, we have some additional programs uh, that are also worth mentioning, and that includes our faculty learning communities. Uh, these are small groups of faculty who meet regularly with one another to create a space for in-depth discussion and learning about a specific topic. So some examples include uh, topics like anti-racist pedagogic critical information literacy, research methods, accessible teaching. Uh, those are just a few. Um, then we also have the Course Design Institute, which is a multi-session program at CTRL that is run by our teaching and learning specialists. And this is designed to help faculty 
uh, either design new courses or rethink courses that they are already teaching uh, and also to develop their teaching practices uh, in a variety of ways. And we just wrapped up that institute yesterday, but there will be more opportunities to attend in the future. Uh, so I, I don't know, Mac, do you want to speak about it briefly or, or maybe later? Um, we do have some extra time. Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can talk about it briefly. So uh, I actually recognize a few, uh, I think all of you from our previous session. So you did hear us uh, talk about uh, the Course Design Institute just briefly. But um, like Anna said, it is a set, a set of four uh, workshops that kind of all go together um, that help faculty rethink and think through how to redesign their courses or design their courses to make them more equitable, inclusive, uh, accessible, all of that. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about course design, uh, at least at this point, we were not going to be running another institute in the summer, um, in this summer since we just finished. But if you need support or resources around course design, please do reach out um, and I'm happy to help facilitate and, and figure out how to get you that information in the in the way that works for you. Great. Thank you, Mac. Um... And then just a quick word on our uh, green teaching program, which is also hosted within CTRL. So the green teaching program, I'm going to just quickly post the link there in the chat. This is a program through which faculty can earn points for um, teaching sustainably uh, and uh, they can get certified as green teachers. And the reward is uh, a logo on your Canvas course page that looks like this. Um, you can also put it on your syllabus. Uh, and so far, we've had over 900 individual AU faculty members be certified at least once since we launched this program in 2008. So it's a program that has grown quite a, quite a bit since we started it. So if you want to uh, apply for a green teaching certificate or, or simply learn more, I did put that uh, link in the chat. I'm also happy to answer questions about it uh, during the Q&A Q &A later. Um, so Finally, just a couple of uh, pieces, uh, important uh, other ways in which we support your teaching or support you in your teaching. Uh, that includes um, the CTRL Faculty Resources website, um, which uh, is uh, you know, a, a huge resource really that, uh, for example, includes our syllabus guide. Uh, it, it includes a collection of teaching strategy suggestions, uh, a comprehensive website with resources and topics. Uh, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's the second link there. I'll put those in the chat in a second um, because it's too hard to multitask and do all of it at once, but I have them ready here. Um, and and some, I, I just before I hand it over to, to my colleagues, I just want to also say we always are looking for faculty input on our programming. And um, you'll see that every post-event evaluation that we share uh, with our participants has a question asking what topics you would be interesting, interested in learning more about. You can also reach out directly to us by email, ctrl.american.edu to let us know. Um, and we also want to know how we can support you as adjunct faculty in your teaching and scholarship. Uh, so I hope we will hear from you and see many of you in our upcoming events this summer and, and perhaps later in the fall. And then just one more quick thing uh, before we move on to the final segment of today's program, I want to briefly put on my other hat and talk very briefly about AU's faculty and staff affinity groups. Um, so this is a, um, a program that has been around at AU for I think four or five years now. Uh, it's a really great way to connect with colleagues across campus from different departments uh, than your own who have shared interests uh, or share backgrounds. Um, and so, so far we have seven affinity groups, uh, but it's a growing number. Uh, you can learn more and become a member at the link uh, that is posted on the slide, uh, american.edu slash hr slash community. I will post that link as well in the chat shortly. Um, but for now, I would like to segue into uh, the last section of today's uh, main uh, adjunct faculty orientation on um, strategies for inclusive pedagogy and a use inclusive excellence plan. So I'd like to welcome my colleagues, Hannah Jardine, Matt Kreit, and Shad Silliman, who are teaching and learning specialists at uh, CTRL. The Zoom is yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so just to let you all know <laughs> uh, that that's gonna happen in one second. So I'm gonna set up the PowerPoint. Okay, one minute. 
And I know that we have a uh, we have an overlapping group from our last session, but we promise we're going to vary it up for you a little bit. So, all right. And uh, so I guess I, I can start with introductions and then pass it over. My name is the last one on the list there. My name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. You all already, or almost all of you got to meet me already. I go by she or they pronouns. I'm now realizing you probably don't need a reintroduction of me. But uh, anyway, I'll let Hannah and, and Mac also say hi yeah. <laughs> as we as we start out and, and take over presenting. Hey, uh, Mac Crate again, that first name on that list. Um, I think I recognize everybody from our last session. Um, so very excited to see you all again and excited to uh, keep working and thinking about inclusive pedagogy. Hi, everyone. Hannah again here. Um, well, welcome to this session. I'll let Mac or no, Shed <laughs> go to the next slide and we'll talk about the outcomes we have for this brief portion here. Um, so by the end of this session, you will be able to reflect on the myth of the average student, apply universal design for learning principles to make your course more accessible, inclusive, and equitable. A lot of the things that we talked about in the previous session fit into the universal design for learning model, but we didn't explicitly introduce you to that. So now you'll be able to uh, learn this framework and kind of map on some of those strategies onto this new framework. And then also identifying relevant teaching support resources and opportunities. Um, but I think we've we've given you enough of that between the last session and what Anna just shared. So we're definitely going to focus more on those top two outcomes. All right. So to get us warmed up for this session, we're interested in hearing from you all in the chat. Uh, what makes you feel included in a learning space? So thinking about learning spaces, that could be a classroom, a formal learning space, or even an informal learning space that you've been in that made you feel included. Janine, being seen. And being seen might be mean literally, seen with eyes and and um, different people have different feelings around eye contact or use eye contact differently. So some, for some folks, eye contact isn't necessarily a way to indicate being seen. But I think that idea of being seen even more broadly beyond um, through eye contact is really important. Um, Sophia saying, when people ask me questions about myself, yeah, this in indication that people care, they want to get to know you, being listened to, um, Melissa. Seconding what Sophia wrote, uh, being asked about your interest, having to respond in general. So I see this, this um, kind of themes around um, be, feeling connected to, feeling that you are recognized, validated, included, having to respond. So um, the reason why we asked this question is because we're going to go into a little bit about inclusive pedagogy and how we can create that classroom environment where students feel included. Um, we can go back to- So sorry, I, <laughs> it was a big accident, sorry. Go back to the warm up chat, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we know that many educational settings don't always make the inclusive learning environment accessible or available to all students, especially those from historically marginalized backgrounds. Uh, we also wanted to point out, like we were in our previous session, um, strategies that we're employing in our presentation that you could use in your classroom. So this question itself is a great one to ask students on the first day of class, um, even before the first day of class, and help them feel seen, feel heard, feel acknowledged, validated, recognized by um, taking their answers and applying that in your course. All right. Thank you, Shen. Sorry. Now I, yeah. I go, yeah. <laughs> So the reason why we're um, we're talking about inclusive pedagogy, well, one, it's extremely important and is integral to effective teaching. But two, uh, now that you're working at AU, AU follows a plan for inclusive excellence. Uh, the first goal in that plan is around learning curriculum and professional development. And we've included some arrows in here to indicate uh, the role that CTRL really plays in this plan. Um, so action step two, 
in goal one is to support all faculty in using inclusive and anti-racist teaching strategies to enhance classroom climate. So Max Shed and I do a lot of this work in all that we do and all the resources that we develop. But we've also pointed to action step four, which is increase AU students' knowledge and awareness of impacts of systems of power, privilege, and inequity, um, as well as BIPOC history, excellence, joy, and resistance, build students' capacity to critically engage and learn from diverse perspectives and skills to use inclusive practices to lead change at AU and beyond. So we hope is that you're not only employing inclusive strategies to include all of your students in their learning, but also bringing in um, content, conversations, um, applications of material that will um, support students in becoming more um, equitable, more inclusive, more justice-oriented um, citizens and students. All right, so next I want to share with you a quote from two of our student partners who I believe I referenced in when Somebody asked a question in the last session. Um, and this came from the resource they created and from the section, I think, around this idea of collective accountability. So uh, what Reba and Kamaya wrote was, we hope to encourage a classroom culture that follows an etiquette of care and respect for both the educator and students. This culture requires an inclusive framework and a conscientious approach to student learning. It is important that both students and educators take accountability for their own learning while also providing those opportunities for learning to happen. Um, so that's just a reminder too that we're connecting with students to think deeply about inclusion and incorporate their perspectives. Um, this particular project focused on the educator-student dynamic. Um, so we encourage you to read that and I'll drop the link in the chat unless one of my colleagues already did. Um, yeah, so with that, I will let you down, it. Hannah, <laughs> the one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll pass it to Shed to talk uh, more about inclusively excellent teaching. Thank you, Hannah. And I really appreciate like that we get to hear from students um, in this instance. It's really cool to get their voices. Um, so how do we apply what our students have asked us to do and what the plan sets out for us, which is inclusively excellent teaching? So I want to give us all a sort of framework to think about when it comes to inclusively excellent teaching, and that's access versus accommodation. This is a disability studies framework, so if you do anything in the uh, realm of like identity studies, this might be a little familiar to you, but the idea is what is accommodation and what is access? Accommodation is making exceptions for those who don't fit the norm, while access is making options available to everyone from the start. I'll give an example to illustrate the difference, which is why I have a picture of an elevator here. I once worked in a building that had eight or nine floors and the elevator only worked up until the third or fourth floor. If you wanted to use it beyond that, you had to have a special key. So if you're, for example, a person with mobility that does just simply does not allow you to walk up eight flights of steps for something, you have to go get a special key. And to get the key, you have to go talk to the building manager and you have to bring them something that proves that you have a disability. And then they have to give you, right, they have to approve. You have to go through all of these different sort of, um, you have to jump through hoops. Right. And that's an accommodation. The baseline assumption is that everyone can use the stairs fine. And if they can't, we'll make an exception for them. Not long after I started working there, they actually changed the elevators, though, so that anyone could use them to get anywhere in the building. No key necessary. That's access. So that's just making it available to everyone from the start instead of having some sort of average person who we assume can do things and making exceptions if they can't. So we want to try and focus more on access in our work, in our teaching, rather than accommodation. So what does this mean? I want to come back to this idea of like an average learner, right? Um, I'm pulling from Todd Rose, and I'm happy to share more of his stuff if you're interested. He gave a TED Talk where he talked about the myth of the average learner. And he gave this example. You ask students to run a 100-meter race, and you provide everyone size 8 running shoes. Who's likely to do the best in the race? Feel free to say in the chat or over video, and it's not a trick question. Who is who's likely to do well in this race? What do you think? Yep. 
Yeah, beautifully said. The ones that fit the size eight, right? It seems simple, but yeah. So maybe some people who are other sizes will, you know, they'll get creative, they'll work their way around it, they'll do well. But unfortunately, our learning system tends to default, we're often to defaults to this, which is there's an average learner and everyone else, we make an exception for them. And we want to change that. What Todd Rose is saying is our education systems often, um, they prepare, you know, assessments and activities and grades for those who fit the size eight, for those who are, um, you know, for a certain group of people. And then the people who happen to fit that model do well, and the people who don't have to find exceptions in order to succeed. So what we want to do is get rid of the idea that there is an average or a normal or a default student and instead appreciate there's going to be all different size shoes, right? There's going to be all different students with different identities. So instead of trying to teach towards one normal figure, let's try and teach for everyone, which is a big task, right? Teaching accessibly rather than with accommodation is a huge task. How do we do it? How do we create courses that are accessible to all of our students? I'm going to pass it to Mac here to explain a framework for this. So the framework that we're going to introduce is called Universal Design for Learning. Um, but what I wanted to do first is share another quote from one of our student partners uh, to again bring in the student uh, student voices, but also know uh, what that Nathaniel is talking about um, uh, UDL principles. So here the quote is, students learn differently. No one learner consumes knowledge and information the same way. If students are not given the opportunity to engage in dialogue, ask questions, or share their own ideas and perspectives, then their learning and development in that classroom is limited. So one framework, again, that framework that we can use to celebrate the different needs, abilities, and just general diversity of our students is the Universal Design for Learning framework. So this originally came from uh, architecture principles and in architecture universal design is the design of products and environments uh, such that they are usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So that uh, example that Shed was sharing about the elevator, that would be one of those uh, instances where they would need specialized design or they would need adaptation, right, to be able to access those other floors before the policy was introduced such that everyone could access all of those floors. So be, everyone being able to access all of those floors would be considered a principle of universal design. Uh, when we apply these principles, uh, uh, go back, thanks. Uh, when we apply these principles to learning, uh, there are three main universal design principles that we talk about. Um, so one is uh, to provide multiple means of engagement. So engagement helps to tap into learners' interests, challenge them appropriately, and motivate them to learn. So for example, this could include choosing topics for, uh, allowing students to choose topics for final papers or providing choice at other points in the semester. Also noted that a lot of you all mentioned that you really like being asked what you like to, what you like to learn or like to ask, um, like to be asked things about yourself. So this is one of the ways that you can incorporate those different student uh, interests and needs in your classroom by providing them with these multiple means of engagement. Uh, UDL also purports to provide multiple means of representation. So what this does is uh, give our learners different ways of acquiring information and knowledge. So this could include things like sharing your course materials in PowerPoint format, video format, maybe through podcasts or other different types of readings. So making sure that that material that we're sharing with students isn't just in one format. Maybe it's not just in that maybe typical uh, textbook format that a lot of us are pretty familiar with. And then finally, the third principle is providing multiple means of action and expression. So this helps provide learners with uh, alternatives for demonstrating what they know. So again, here you could give options for assessments. Maybe your final presentation could be a presentation or a paper or developing an infographic, or maybe even uh, allowing students to record a presentation and play that presentation in class instead of speaking live. So what all of these principles do um, is make sure that we don't change our learning outcomes, but instead uh, we make sure we're considering our different student experiences from the beginning of our course and incorporating multiple resources and paths to success. Uh, so I just dropped a link in the chat for you all to read a little bit more about UDL, but we know that UDL is a huge task, right? So this is a huge framework, it's a lot of information, um, and it can feel a bit overwhelming the first time that you hear about it. So we want to introduce you to a strategy that's a little bit more easy to apply, which is called this plus one strategy. 
And so what this asks of us as educators is, is there just one more way that you can help people learners on task? Just one more way that you can give them information or just one more way that they could demonstrate their skills. And we like to bring that uh, principle to all of, our, uh, all of our education and all of the teaching that we do because it's a lot easier to just change one thing per semester or one thing per iteration of class. And then over time, your course can become even more equitable and student-centered. So what we're gonna do now um, is give you all a chance to kind of apply and think about the information that we just shared um, and uh, utilize this thing called a Google Jamboard. Um, so if you're not familiar, uh, uh, Google Jamboard is a good tool that you can use where students can kind of add like sticky notes to a virtual whiteboard. Um, and this facilitates interaction in a way that doesn't require anyone to speak, but also allows students to read and see each other's perspectives. So what we're asking you to do is on that Jamboard, share at least one strategy that falls into one of those three UDL principles, either engagement, representation, or action and expression. And we have a separate page for each of those, um, each of those principles. Um, so you can feel free to spread out along that Jamboard um, or just share those things on those slides that are most, uh, that most speak to you. And I wonder, Shed, if you could sh um, pull up the Jamboard so folks can see what it looks like. So you see the Jamboard here um, and you've got a spot to add your own sticky note. So if you click that fourth button down, you can add your own sticky note where you uh, would share some ways to spark excitement and motivation. You can also change the color up at the top. And then if you click those little arrows um, up at the top, uh, you can go to the next slides. So we'll give you all maybe a, a couple minutes, two or three minutes to start to populate these with a few different ideas that you have for how to apply these UDL principles. I do want to point out for a reason unknown to me, Google populates all of the sticky notes to the same exact location. So if you're wondering where yours went, <laughs> that's where it is. And I might move them around just to make sure we can see hidden uh, stickies. Very good point there, Shed. And as you all are adding uh, your things, again, to put on that kind of meta hat, this is another great way to allow multiple different voices to be heard in the classroom without share, without speaking. Um, it can also allow you to get a lot of information out at once, right? Because everyone can be adding their sticky notes, and then you as the instructor can maybe summarize out the themes that you're starting to see, which is what I'm going to do now. So I'll open the, the Jamboard on my side and see what we're starting to see. All right, if you could go back to the first one, Shen, I can't get the Jamboard to open. So we're seeing some folks talk about uh, choice, so allowing students to choose their own project questions, data sets, um, thinking about why students are taking the class and how to support their learning goals. I love that. That could be something that you include in like an intro survey. Um, you can ask them why they're interested in your topic. Give them the opportunity to share their work or responses in different formats. Love that. Anything on the other slides there, Shed? We've got what are some ways beyond traditional text on slides to present information? Um, so here you could share videos, but making sure that those videos have transcripts um, for accessibility needs. You could also ask students what they what they expect from the course or what they need from the course. Maybe you have some students who really prefer to learn through um, listening, and so then you'd want to make sure any materials that you have can be accessed through uh, an auditory lens uh, format. And do we have anything on that last slide? All right, that's okay. Um, so as we finish up today, um, we hope that this was a good modeling of a different of an activity that you could use in class, and also that you'll have a few ideas for different ways that you can start to incorporate some of these principles in your classroom. Thank you, Mac. And I'm just going to lead us here on our wrap up. I want to give you a quick reminder that inclusive teaching is a process. It's not a finite list of things that we perfectly achieve and then we're done forever. It's ongoing. We're always improving and getting better. And as the world changes and students change and we change, 
Um, we keep updating our approach so that we be, like Max said, our courses get more inclusive and more equitable over time. So in the chat for our sort of farewell <laughs> uh, reflection here, we want to ask, what's that just one strategy that you want to try? Uh, maybe this summer, maybe the next class you teach, what's an addition? What's your just one, your plus one that you want to give a shot next time that you are teaching? And it could be any of the strategies we talked about today or one that you've just thought of right now. I love this question, like, what do you want to learn from this course? It's a great question. And also coming back to trauma-informed teaching, um, letting people, or like reminding people why they got into a topic or took a course is a good way to motivate them. I'm just going to give it a moment for any other folks to share, but besides that... <laughs> yeah, when it's required, that does kind of right. Maybe remind them why are you why are you pursuing your education? You know what do you like? Often there it'll come back to a reason. You know that can kind of help motivate them again. Like you know, remember your goals. Remember what's important to you. What makes you feel um, helpful and and purposeful? Uh, doing a Google form prior to the class. Love that. Yeah, gathering some info about our students. Um, getting to know them a little makes them feel seen and, and acknowledged, right? So just to be mindful of time, I'm just gonna pause us here. Um, and Hannah, Mac, anything else we wanna say as we wrap up? Cool. All right, and I'm gonna pass it back to you. And if you do have other things to share, please do share. And as always, we are really happy to hear from you. All right. Do you want to leave? Oh, here we go. Yeah, so I just realized something um, uh, before we, uh, so we do have uh, about 15 minutes or so left for any questions you might have, but I also realized because we have a pretty small group this time, that's usually the case for summer, uh, we could do what normally is done at the beginning of a session like this. If, if do, do you all want to introduce yourselves? Uh, maybe share what department you teach? Uh, who knows, maybe some of you are teaching in the same department and you can connect. Um, Let's see if there's an interest in that. And then we, of course, also will take questions uh, during this Q&A period as well. But um, we can do the popcorn method where uh, I popcorn it over to, for example, Vera. Would you like to introduce yourself and then pop it over to somebody else? Yes, that's me. <laughs> yeah, I am. Vera, Vera Lucia Felicic. I am from Brazil and I am waiting my my visa, J1, J1 visa from because in August I will be a research uh, visitor in American University. I am very excited about this and uh, <laughs> yes, and I hope and find um, everyone there and some, I think we'll be a, a very great monks. We will stay six months um, there. And I think we'll be uh, change a lot uh, ideas and process to learning, to teach and, okay. It's, it's like. So before we pop it over to somebody else, I just learned uh, through the secret uh, direct messaging in Zoom that you all know each other already because you did introductions in the previous session. So if you're up for it, why don't you just share something that you didn't share before? One thing. Uh, and um, I will then watch the video of last session later so I can get to know you that way. Carl, what's the unique thing about you? Um. I mentioned before, I am an alum. I did my doctorate at uh, AU. I was part of uh, Dr. Daniel Sayers' uh, Great Dismal Swamp Landscape Study. Wow. Uh, that's where my dissertation was focused on. Uh, I also teach at National Presbyterian School, which is a pre-K three through sixth grade school, a half mile down the road from AU. We have very strong ties. Many of your uh, undergraduates that are getting degrees in education come in our 
our uh, TAs and after three program. So uh, I'm very excited to, to be affiliated with AU as a uh, adjunct and an alum and with my uh, connection to uh, National Presbyterian School. <clears throat> Great. Anyone else wants to share uh, something new? Um, I'm also an alum of AU for my master's. And um, funny enough, the course I teach is the one that I took many years ago as a student. So um, it's been a it's been a good time. Fun. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Daka Spencer, and I'll be teaching um, a negotiation and bargaining class at the Washington College of Law. Uh, I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. It's my first time teaching, so. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Tyrone Shaw. I am a teacher for DCPS, but I'll be teaching in the ed school um, this fall um, for a methods course. So I'm looking forward to it. Hi, everyone. I'm Sofia Perez uh, Hill. I'm going to be a visiting scholar this semester. I'm in Colombia right now, and I will stay here in Colombia for the semester. But I plan on going to uh, the AU campus at least a few times just to get to know everyone. Um, a fun fact about me, I'm a big Shakira fan. I'm Colombian, so you would imagine. <laughs> um, and I'm very excited about uh, being a visiting scholar at AU this semester. Great. I, excuse me, I have an important Shakira question, Anna, if I may. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sophia, do you prefer Shakira before she came to the U.S.? Like that music, like when she had like yes. dark hair, or when she came? Okay, me too. Have yes, you ever totally. Uh, <laughs> yeah, her music in Spanish is so much better than her her music in English. Like, if you're planning on learning Spanish, that could be a good motivation to listen to Shakira's songs in Spanish, which are way better <laughs> than her songs in English. I have an album recommendation. I have track recommendations. Just hit me up, everyone, and I am happy to share all of my Shakira suggestions. Thank yeah, you. Me too. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> I guess I'll go. Hi, everyone. I'm Danine um, Carrington Martin. I will be teaching at AU Law in the fall. I'm super duper excited. Um, a fun fact, since we're talking music, I am a member of the Beehive. I am very serious about Beyonce, very serious. Um, and that's it. I'm, I'm very excited about all of the resources. Um, this was a great day of learning for me. Um, and I'm just, I'm just super excited. I wanna delve into the resources. I'm a little bit older. And so for me, technology, um, I've been a little intimidated by all of the technology. And my IT person is my son who's about to go to college. So he's leaving. So I'm being forced now to learn on my own and I'm welcoming all of this um, knowledge. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, I think I can go next. Um, my name is Rikia, I'm actually currently in Kenya. Um, I do work for AU abroad. I've been with AU for two years now. Um, uh, and I'm excited to actually uh, become part of the adjunct faculty and sort of immerse myself in the AU culture. Um, we do tend to stay in our little bubble um, when we are abroad. Um, I do have a few colleagues in Brussels and some in Kenya, so we pretty much stick to ourselves. So it's nice to see um, the wider community that is there at AU, and I'm excited to actually immerse myself and get to learn even more um, in my journey with AU. That's great. Thank you so much. We did have a couple of shares or one share at least in the chat as well. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, Shed, uh, if you feel more comfortable sharing in the chat, absolutely. So we do with our students as well. Uh, it is a Saturday, though. Uh, I, I keep forgetting because I normally don't work on Saturdays. So I, I don't want to keep you uh, for longer unless there are any specific questions. You can always reach out to ctrl at american.edu or to any of us. Um, you can find our, our emails on the CTRL website. 
I really look forward to seeing you on campus uh, or at our virtual events. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Um, we'll stay around a little bit if there are any, any remaining questions, but thanks to all the presenters and also for all of you for taking time out of your Saturday for this. Thank you and good luck with your courses. <laughs>